So hello everyone and welcome to the Digital Engagement Actions webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I can see that a few people are still dripping in, um, but hopefully that will still make sense for them when they join us a few minutes later. But I want to get cracking because there's a lot of us and we've got a lot of content to go through. So I want to make sure that you, you get what you want to out of this webinar. So I just wanted to say, yeah, firstly, just thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I know that the format is potentially going to be a little bit different to usual. I'll discuss that a bit more in a moment, but I hope that you'll still be able to get enough out of this that you feel like you can go away and action some of what we're sharing. So the focus of this webinar, of course, will be on engagement actions, which are things that you can do to enrich your supporters experience all year round. But of course, we're doing this webinar now because people are facing new challenges with engaging your supporters. So as you know, there's a global crisis going on and it's, it's kind of changed everybody's business as usual. Now, I know some of you will be thinking you've had to shelve a lot of your plans. You've had to change a lot of your plans and you're trying to adapt based upon this new crisis, whether that means that you're communicating about the crisis or you're not communicating or trying to work out how to communicate because of the changes, because you can't do your usual issue. I hope that there'll be something useful on this webinar for you, regardless of whether you feel your organization is working on Corona or not working on Corona. So we're hoping to provide some ideas, some inspiration and also some tips on process that you could follow if you're looking to create your own engagement actions. So I wanted to, before we move much further, just do a quick note on technology. So the platform that we're using today for this webinar has a few ways that you can interact with us. The two most important ways are the chat box and the Q&A box. The chat box, I'd really encourage you to use this if you have any observations or any technical issues that you'd like to flag up throughout the call. Um, my colleague Jess, who I'll introduce you to in a second, will be keeping an eye on that and helping you out wherever possible. For the Q&A box, please use this if you have questions directly relating to the webinar. These questions will be saved. We will do our best to answer as many of them in the call as we can. But realistically, we've got over 100 people on this webinar right now, so we might have to answer some of those questions after the call. But if you use the Q&A box, those questions will be stored so we can get back to them later. Whereas the chat box is temporary, though that content will not be saved. The other thing to note is that typically I have very good internet. I'm very fortunate in my home office, but of course everybody is now working from home. And so the reliability of my internet is not what it used to be. So if on the occasion that I lose connectivity, I ask that you please be patient for five to 10 minutes while I try to reconnect. But if that is not successful, we have a backup plan. So we've pre-recorded this webinar already. So if you can't finish the webinar with me live, we'll be sending through a video so you can get it either way. So don't panic if the technology fails us. That happens sometimes. We will still make sure that you get the content. So let's see if I can enable my webcam to say hello. I'm not sure if that's coming through yet. Ah, I think that is. Hi. So my name is Claire. Nice to meet you guys. Um, and joining me on this call is my colleague Jess. Jess, can you say hello? Just enabling my webcam. I can hopefully yes, say hello. Hi. So yeah. hi from hi from Wales. Turn that off. Oh, can't quite see. Yeah. So Jess's name pops up on GoToWebinar as Claire as well. So uh, we're not both called Claire. It's just the technology is a bit confused. So yes, hello, my name is Claire and I work for an agency called Marnion. Um, we are, there's about 17 of us, I think in total, uh, including my colleague Jess, who will be helping to facilitate this call today. We are a digital mobilization agency. This means that we specialize in all things about supporters and getting supporters to take actions. So whether that's campaigning, fundraising, support communications, all of them together, that's the sort of thing that we do exclusively. We also only work with charities and not-for-profits, so we're very focused in who we work with. And we are able to support charities and not-for-profits in a number of ways, from consultancy work to um, doing creative work and development work. We also have a, 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 a platform of technology called Campanian, which is for campaigning actions, for fundraising actions, for any kind of form you can think of. So we do consultancy, technology, design. Some of our clients, we do very small projects where we just do some consultancy work, for example, or just technology. For some of our clients, we do enormous projects that last multiple years, 
where we handle all of their support communications. So we're very much able to adapt to the scale of the organization and your specific needs. We work with a huge range of charities from the, the biggest ones out there to I think our, my smallest current client is just one person who works from their home office. So we work with a whole different range of people. So whether you're enormous, medium, small, there's, there's something that we, we could do to help you. But enough about us. Um, so into the talk about engagement. Before we talk about engagement actions in isolation, I wanted to take a moment to think about the broader context. So an engagement action, of course, is a part of a supporter journey. They seldom stand in isolation. You might already have supporter journeys that are running. I would expect that you do, whether you call them supporter journeys or not. Um, you've probably maybe got a welcome journey in, in place with a mix of emails, for example. Um, some of you might have automated journeys happening at the moment, and this is my reminder to check them. And if you've got, for example, a, an event automation that's running, do you have a marathon coming up or something like this? check your automations and make sure you're turning them off if that event is no longer running or if it's changed. So with support journey, I would define support journey as a coherent series of communications. So they could be emails, they could be phone calls, it could be posts sent to your supporters. And they should have a clear purpose and a narrative to them. So I like to, when I'm designing a support journey, I like to categorize them, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second, the types of communications. I think that all communications should have a primary purpose to them. So if you're trying to achieve like three or four things with each email, with each telephone call, for example, you're probably not gonna do a very good job at any of them. I think it's very important that you have a primary purpose for every communication. And based upon these primary purposes, these primary objectives, I categorize communications based upon what they're trying to achieve. So if they're trying to win campaigns, trying to engage a supporter, if they're trying to build loyalty or they're trying to raise money, these are all primary objectives that you might be, be looking for if you're running a, a supporter journey with the communications with that. So just to show you an example of what a supporter journey might look like with that color coding in place. This is a welcome journey example. And you can see there's a mixture of campaigning emails, loyalty emails, donations, and of course, the engagement actions. So they're a part of a broader series of communications, and it's important that they are considered in that way, because being a bit scattergun with communications leads to much weaker supporter experiences. I think a lot, a lot of you have this already, um, but if you don't have a copy of either of these documents, we of course have them in digital formats, which we can share, so you don't need to worry about leaving your, your confinement to get one. Um, we, if you want to get one of these, you can drop us an email. The most effective way of making sure you get all of our free reports is simply by joining our email list, and we'll be in touch maybe once or every week or two, sending you a new bit of content, case study, report, etc. But in this report, you can look through some of our, our tips for how to put together a support journey, which in course, of course includes engagement. I also wanted then to look at the broader context, which is that we are going through a global crisis right now, and we can't ignore that fact. I suspect it's why a lot of you are on the call right now. So we want to continue to engage our supporters through this. Some organizations have found that they have been able to do campaigning and fundraising work in light of the crisis. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to acknowledge that work and to focus on how when things change, it is possible to adapt to that changing environment. So for example, Shelter running a campaign around safe housing during the crisis. Global Justice Now doing run around vaccines and affordability when the time comes. We've got some great loyalty content coming from Lena Cheshire. We've got some fundraising asks, for example, Water Aid um, and Alzheimer's Society, because their issues directly connect to the crisis. It's affecting the people and the work that they do. So that completely makes sense. I also wanted to flag up to you uh, a really interesting opportunity to adapt physical real world events into the digital space. For example, I think the marathon is a great, a great one because so many charities take part in the marathon, raise money through the marathon. And of course, they're not going to be happening this year, certainly not in the next few months. So I wanted to highlight some brilliant work that Jean O'Brien and Adrian O'Flynn have been doing. So um, Jean runs the Digital Charity Lab. Have a, have a look at that podcast there. They've been working on creating challenges, virtual challenges, predominantly through Facebook, 
where people can be sponsored to do physical activities that aren't in a group. So that's a really nice option as well to consider if you're someone who works on like running events or any kind of active group event. Check out our podcast. I think you'll find that it's useful. So I know many people can't campaign right now. Fundraising events are getting cancelled. Some organisations can continue to campaign, but I know that whether you're continuing or not, you're going to have challenges with your support communications at the moment. So you're, I'm sure all of you have joined this call because you're thinking about how you can improve your support engagement and therefore you're trying to address a challenge. So I'd like to take a minute to just think about what your challenges are in relation to engaging your supporters online. And I'd also like to take a moment here to contextualise how we're going to handle the engagement here. So as you know, um, this webinar has been exceptionally popular. Um, we've had an enormous number of people respond, like 260 odd people have signed up this, this webinar. So we've had to adapt the way that we're, we're managing it a little bit. We normally run our, our webinars to be relatively interactive. There'd be moments to stop, to discuss, to share ideas. And with that many people, it becomes a little bit unsustainable. So instead, what we're doing is this webinar will continue to be a lot of me talking at you. So sorry about that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to follow up with some workshops where we do get to have discussions, come up with ideas, develop solutions together. But of course, the workshops will not, it won't be possible to run those to everybody because the capacity on them is a lot smaller. So we're going to run about three workshops with a maximum of 20 people in each. And of course, you can run your own workshops if you decide not to join one of those or if you can't get into one of those. But what we'd like to do is to make sure that the workshops we're designing are appropriately structured to address your challenges. So in order to do that, I, I would ask that we could we'd move into a really quick activity here where we ask for your feedback on challenges so that we can shape those workshops. So I'm going to hand over to Jess now, who can introduce this for us. Hi there, um, I'm Jess and we're going to try a little bit of um, interactivity here, which obviously is quite a challenge with, I think we've got 130 people on the call at the moment. So bear with us and if this doesn't work for you or you don't want to take part, we'll only spend a few minutes on it by all means, um, wait it out and we'll, we'll get back into the meat of the webinar in a few minutes. So what we wanted to do was partly, as Claire says, to, to make sure that we're gathering some information that allows us to inform the next stage of, of what we're going to offer. Um, but also we felt it would be quite interesting for, for you as participants to get um, a bit of a picture of what other people are facing at the moment, what you're dealing with, what, what your key concerns are. So what we wanted to ask you is, is what are your key challenges in relation to supporter engagement? And in order to kind of split that out a bit, um, what we've done is create five different Google Docs, which we'd like you to pick the, the one that feels the most relevant to, to you and go and add your challenges. So I'm going to post, if you have a look in the little chat window, I'm about to post a list of links and I'll just read through. I know that chat window is really small, so you may need to do a little bit of scrolling up and down um, to see all of the content. So I'll just post that now. Um, and okay, and hopefully the bit.ly links are not appearing as links. So you may need to copy paste those into the into the address bar of a browser. But what I'm asking you to do is decide which of these statements collect, um, uh, corresponds to your own situation. So our issue doesn't connect with the crisis at all. Obviously, all of us are affected by the crisis, but in relation to your organization's issue, does your issue um, have really no relation to the crisis? It's just disrupting your work because it's disrupting everything. Um, if your issue, in that case, uh, uh, pick up that first link, bit.ly, no connection. Um, our issue connects directly with the crisis and we're actively campaigning. Please go to that second link. Number three, our issue connects directly with the crisis, um, but we're, we're not sure how, um, but we're not currently campaigning. Uh, number four, our issue could be connected to the crisis in some way. We haven't really worked out how that, how that could work. And number five, our, our challenge is something different. Sorry, that uh, link seems to have got lost in the pasting. I'll just pop that one in. Sorry, this chat window is less than pretty. So that's the fifth link. So please, Pop a question in the chat if you're like um, lost or unclear about what you need to do. But we'll just take three or four minutes um, for people to pop their experiences in. So just pop that into a browser and answer the question that's in the document.
I feel like we need hold music. Yeah, I can I can see lots of typing, which is really encouraging. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. <laughs> so we'll just take it's um yeah, we'll just take two to three minutes here. This is great. Thank you, everybody. I can see lots of really interesting stuff coming in. Okay, I can see the typing slowing down a little bit. So just um, a few last seconds to finish what you want, uh, what you want to say, and then just pop back into the main pane. Those documents will remain available. So if you want to come back to them at the end of the um, end of the session to to fill them in, um, we'll we'll give an extra hour or so at the end before we close them and and circulate to the group afterwards. So just the last few seconds, and then if I'll uh, hand back to Claire. Cool, thank you very much. Um, and of course, if you want to contribute those ideas anonymously, please do. If you want to attribute, please do. That's always very helpful. So thank you all very much for your participation there. As I say, we'll be using the input there to shape the follow-up uh, workshops that will be going on. So I hope that a number of you can participate in those. I think that would be really valuable. We're planning on doing those in about two weeks' time. So in this webinar, we are going to be looking at what an engagement action is, we're going to be looking at how you design one, so going through the process, or at least a process, there's no, there's no one right way. And we're going to be looking at some examples of engagement actions to hopefully spark a little bit of inspiration. So to start off, we're going to look at what an engagement action is. So this is my definition. Now again, most of these things, there's no one answer here. You know, we're not mathematicians, um, but I hope that by giving my definition, it helps us to get on the same page with what we're talking about. So I define an engagement piece of content as something that is giving something to supporters rather than taking. So for example, with a campaigning action or a fundraising action, you're asking for stuff. Please sign this petition. Please write this email. Please give us money. Whereas with engagement, you're thinking about the supporters' needs first rather than your own. Also, it needs to be active. It shouldn't be something people can um, passively experience. So, for example, if you're reading a blog or you're watching a video and your hands are in your lap 
and you're not using voice dictation or anything interactive, that's not an engagement piece of content, in my opinion. That's loyalty. It's still very valuable, but it's not engagement. It has to be active. I do set that bar quite low, though, and it's often very possible to take something that is loyalty and to make it engagement just with a tiny tweak. But by thinking about that distinction and thinking about um, is this active and should it be, I've seen that some good content has become great content. So I do find that distinction to be quite valuable. I would also say that engagement piece should not primarily be about achieving a campaigning or fundraising goal. It's OK if it also does that. But the first thing it should be trying to do should be about serving the needs of the supporter, not about getting something from them. So on to how to design a great engagement action. So this is this is the process I follow. As I say, there's there's no one perfect way of doing this, but I hope that by sharing this process here, it's it's helpful for people to adapt it, to apply it, to make use of it in their own organizations. So the steps I would typically follow. First off, your objective. As with any piece of content, any type of communication that you're doing, you have to start with strategy. Because if you start with, hey, this could be cool, this would be fun, I'd love to try X, you're probably not spending your time and your money in the most effective way possible. So always make sure that the first thing you do is say, what are we trying to achieve here? And how do we measure it? So that's obviously your metrics. Everything else has to come afterwards. You then look at your audience. Who are they? What motivates them? Creative process, idea creation, selection, and development. Don't worry, we're going to make these slides available. So if any of you are frantically typing, you can relax. Um, you can just copy this from the slides after the fact. So to dive into that in a little bit more detail, objectives, I mean, that's quite obvious. What are you trying to achieve? Um, for example, maybe your engagement action is trying to increase the retention rate of donors. Maybe you're trying to increase your audience's understanding of the issue. Maybe you're trying to recruit new supporters. You know, there's so many different objectives you could achieve with an engagement action. But it's really important you know what yours is. Write it down, because having it in your head is not as valuable as having it written down so that you can share it with colleagues and make sure that you don't forget or get confused or start working towards a different objective and not realizing it wasn't your original intention. So write it down. And with objectives, I always encourage that you prioritize them. So I understand that some things do have more than one objective. Maybe you're primarily looking to raise money, but also if you educate your supporters, that's great too. But what's really important here is that you have a hierarchy. So you have to know what is your most important objective and what are the ones beneath it in order. Because there's gonna come a time where the objectives that you have are in conflict with each other. And in order to make a strategic decision, you need to know what your priorities are. So be ruthless. I know this one can be tricky, especially if there's objectives from multiple parts of the organization. But you'll, you'll be grateful you did this. Once you have your objectives in place, and of course you've thought through the metrics for them, you can start thinking about your audience. So who are your audience? Who are you communicating with and how do you identify them? And you want to be as specific as possible. The test that I would usually apply to see if this has been effective if you've done this exercise well is can you take the sentence or two that you've written down give it to your data team and get the exact people you want and nobody else yeah so for example instead of just saying i want to communicate with non-donors you might be more specific and say i would like to communicate with supporters who have only been on the list for less than three months and are not yet donors you want to make sure that you've been really specific who to include and who to exclude and then you can learn a bit more about them because even within one uh, supporter list for one organization, there'll be lots of different subgroups with very different needs and motivations. So the next question for your audience is what motivates them to engage? Obviously, creating something that you want them to do is great, but if they don't then take that action, you've kind of wasted your time and your money. So it's important to think about why would people take this action? What would inspire them to do it? For example, maybe it's fun. That's a really good one. You know, if you're trying to engage someone in something, it being fun is a really great motivator. Maybe it's informative, depending on your audience, that might be really attractive, but for some audiences, it won't be. So just by knowing who you're talking to, you can decide and understand their motivations. And of course, 
of interest. It's the classic like which Harry Potter house are you a member of? Which adorable animal do you relate to most? Um, that's a real big motivator and it shouldn't be dismissed. It's fun. People like thinking about themselves and a lot of content such as quizzes is often based on this idea of self-interest. But of course, when we're thinking about motivation, we're not really in a business as usual mode right now. So people's needs and motivations, I think right now are a lot different to maybe even just a month ago. Maybe they need to feel comforted, they need to feel connected, they need information. So in the time of this, this lockdown, this pandemic, people probably have very different needs and it's important that you adapt and consider those needs. Then it's... So with creativity, it's one of those things that I think gets overlooked a lot, but it's, it really pays off to take the time and to do it right. So in an ideal world, a creative process, a creative process would allow you to come up with ideas, to narrow down those ideas and to you know, select the good ones and develop them in a way that means you're not just doing the same old tactic again and again and again. It's the classic, like if you're campaigning, you don't want to keep doing a petition. If you're fundraising, you don't want to keep asking for the same thing in the same way. Creativity really, really pays off. Now, if you've never really done this before and you're thinking, I'm not creative, first off, you are. Everybody's creative. They just need the right um, format and the right support to be creative and to come up with these ideas. But everyone has a lot of creativity in them. It's just, it's often untapped. So I recommend, if you've never done this before, have a look for resources online. There's loads of free resources. There's also loads of really great books out there. Um, one that I reach for quite regularly is this one called Idea Agent. This one talks you through creative processes, but it's also really practical and hands-on. It's got lots of exercises. So you can dive right in and say, I'm trying to come up with ideas. What exercises can I do? I'm trying to narrow down selecting ideas. What exercises can I do? This is a really uh, great book, and I do recommend this. So with creative um, idea creation and development, you really need to make sure you've carved out time for it. So I say that half a day's time is probably what you're swinging for as a minimum to create ideas. So that's not for the whole process, but that's really just to create the initial ideas. In a dream scenario, you'd have even longer, but this is, I would say, the minimum. And I know that sounds like a lot, especially when you're very busy and there's just so much to do, but I promise you it will pay off. I also encourage you to change your environment. Now, I know that can feel a bit difficult when we're working from home, we're all sitting at the same place every day, but even if that means going into a different room or using a different bit of technology, um, using anything that makes it feel a little bit unusual for you. Because if you just do, if you sit at the same desk that you sit at all day long and try to be creative, you'll find that most of your ideas you come up with will end up being the same ideas. So changing your your space and your mindset can make a big difference creativity. You need to make sure you've written what we call a focus question. Focus question is something you can keep making sure that all of your ideas are contributing towards this specific question. So have a look into focus questions actually. There's some great free literature out there on developing a great one. I also I recommend the Greenpeace Mobilization Lab, or sorry, rather the Mobilization Lab, they, they're separate now, who have some fantastic resources on focus questions. For example, you could have a focus question that was, how might we build up the knowledge of our new supporters in a fun way so that they're more likely to make a financial donation? Now you know what your goal is, how you want to do it, who your audience is, what the ultimate outcome is. This is the kind of question you print up, stick somewhere, or put in a digital space really big so that you can keep redirecting your attention there as you go creative. So then step one of creativity, it's idea generation. So volume, volume, volume. I would say the minimum ideas you want for an initial idea, idea generation session is 50. But if you've got a group of more than five people and you've got at least a couple hours, go for 200. Think big. Volume is really, really valuable here. Um, because the more ideas you have, you get all of the obvious stuff out of the way. And then the weird and unusual things start to emerge. And it's usually in the unusual ideas that you wouldn't have automatically had in that first hour that you find the, the gold that can really create something special. So first, the first stage is volume. The second stage is selection. So you need to agree what the criteria are for selecting an action. E.g., how likely is it to help you achieve your objective and how much time and money will it take to do? 
And then once you've agreed your criteria, they don't have to be this, this is just a suggestion. You can go through, select ideas that you think are worth developing. Which moves on to stage three, which is idea development. So with this, obviously, you're, you're taking these post-it note ideas and developing into something where you have really specific ideas of how you're going to execute this, what technology you need, what input you need, how it's going to work, who you're going to send it to, all the details, all the practicalities will be developed in this session. You also might consider using a minimal viable product approach. A minimal viable product approach simply means that you test the concept with as little time and money as possible. So a great example of this is if you were going to do a big bells and whistles quiz. Before you do that and you spend all of your money and time in developing one quiz, we'd recommend that you come up with a couple quiz concepts, test them using existing technology, so nice and quick, out the door in a couple hours, see which ones people respond to best, and then you can develop the, the final product from the minimal viable product, if that makes sense. So it's kind of a, a quick and dirty solution to see if your idea works. And of course, if you can, do tests. Testing is always valuable, but I appreciate not always possible. Then of course, you can launch. So that's that's probably the process I would go through. So those three stages, sometimes those three stages take months, sometimes they take days. It really depends on your resources and also your ambition and urgency. So I want to share with you now some examples of engagement actions. And I've categorized these based upon the objective that they're trying to meet. So the first example is a quiz. I think most people, when they think of engagement, probably the first thing they think of is a quiz. They're very popular right now. But I'd like to emphasize this is very much not where the engagement process stops. A quiz is just one of 100 different tactics. So this example here is from Friends of the Earth, and they are fantastic at the minimal viable product approach. So what they did is they designed three different quizzes they built them on an existing quiz platform, so it was nice and quick, very low cost, and they tested them with a small pot of people to see which ones gave them, this was for recruitment. So their metric was which ones had the lowest cost per support recruited. Once they saw which quiz um, approach was working for them, they built out this beautiful quiz, which we see here on the right. So they were able to then recruit lots of people for small cost by doing a minimal viable product approach. And by knowing that recruitment was their goal, they knew what metric they were looking at to see what was successful. Obviously, uh, share actions were a great example of uh, an objective of recruiting their supporters. If you can do something a little bit richer, a little, a little bit more interesting than just please share this link to our petition, you might find that you've got a, a lot more engagement and perhaps a lot more people coming back. And I know a lot of organizations find that the supporters who are most engaged and stick with them the longest are those who are recruited through share. So it is a channel that's worth thinking about properly. The next objective I'd like to look at is educating new supporters. So in this first example, this is a, a project that we worked with Freedom from Torture on. And their challenge was that they had brand new people and they wanted to educate them on a number of things. But this particular communication was trying to educate them on where torture happens. Now, of course, thinking about motivation, that's quite a, an upsetting topic. That's not really a motivating topic to click through on like, did you know torture happens in this country? Yes, how many people do you think are torture? It's, it's not really inspiring. So to take that really challenging topic and make it accessible, but also educational, uh, we worked together to come up with this quiz around recipes. So one of the things that Freedom From Torture does to support their, the people that they work with, so they help to rehabilitate people who've been tortured, um, they do cooking groups and people make recipes from their home countries. And we, so we already had all of this content. We already had brilliant pictures of, of food that they'd made. We had recipes, we had testimonies from people in the cooking groups. And so we created a quiz where people had to guess what country these dishes were from. And these are dishes that weren't particularly common in the UK, so a lot of people might not know. And then on the, the next step, once they guessed, they either got correct or incorrect. A little bit of the case study of the person who made it, you know, how it reminded them of home, who they used to make it with, etc. And then a little bit of explanation around why that person is with freedom from torture, i.e. did you know torture happens in Sri Lanka? And then again, there'll be another question. So they were learning about where torture happens through food. And then on the thank you page of this, we provided recipes for all of the, the, the 
the food meals that we uh, that we just looked at. And that's a really nice way of connecting people with the people who are affected by torture, with the countries that it happens in, but also providing some richness by giving them the recipes from the survivors on the thank you page. The next example around educating new supporters. This is an example of when we worked with Care International and they wanted to communicate about the issue of uh, sexual harassment in garment factories uh, in, in a, a couple of countries, but especially Bangladesh. And we didn't want to just create a blog and ask people to read the blog. So what we did is we hired a graphic artist, an illustrator, to create this, this graphic novel for us, which tells the story of Sumi. Now, of course, the experience of this is different depending on your device. So you'd be swiping on a mobile, clicking on a desktop, for example, and you would navigate and move through this comic. Now, again, in terms of engagement, that's quite low, right? I'm just, I'm just swiping, I'm just clicking, but it pulls you in in a way that doesn't make you more active. And of course, it allowed us to then have a donate ask on the final step of this. Another example, this is a great one for how an organization has adapted to the corona crisis. So fair trade provide resources to schools, but of course at the moment schools are shut down. So what they did, thinking about who their audience is and what the audience needs are, they created home learning kits for different ages and they've provided that for, for parents to download. So this is a really good example of how they've adapted and how they've responded to their audience's needs rather than their needs. The, the next example I have for you is around um, educating. If you wanted to educate your supporters on an issue. Yes, this one is a weird one. So um, one of our clients uh, called Our Fish, and they work on European fishing policy, trying to make fishing more sustainable. And they've got this bank of <laughs> naked celebrities, some of whom are surprisingly A-list, posing with, with fish, dead fish, of course. And so given that we already had this content, and we wanted people to understand more about the species that were at risk from overfishing, we created a bit of a tongue in cheek quiz where we asked people to identify what the fish was, which was posing with the celebrity was posing with, but not directly addressing the fact that, you know, there's a naked Helena Bonham Carter on this tuna, but do you know if it's a tuna? Um, and through this, people were able to learn about what fish species were at risk, but also it was a bit playful and a bit fun, and they can see the celebrities support the issue as well. Another great, very recent example of education is Global Justice Now have just started doing webinars for their supporters. So they typically have in-person events, uh, support conferences and the like, and of course they've had to cancel those lately. So this technology-wise, this is very accessible, this is simply a Zoom webinar. So anyone can set one of these up, but it, the way they've done it, I think is great because it really encourages people to participate, to learn, to share, and to, to feel connected with the organization, even when they can't physically attend these events. The next objective I'd like to look at is around building loyalty and or morale. So I think right now people are feeling a little bit, some people feel a bit nervous and disconnected and soothing activities are actually so much more needed right now than they have been before. And I think they're also quite a big motivator right now. So going back to our fish, we, we launched just last week actually this this origami action. So we wanted to reiterate the messaging around how overfishing is connected to climate change and how fish are heroes because they're helping protect us against climate change. And to do that, we had this little origami challenge where we gave people instructions, made the origami, they shared the origami that they'd made, and it made them feel a bit more connected to the issue, but it also gave them something to do while they're at home, especially if they're at home with, uh, with um, children. And this was run in four languages because all of our, our fish workers and of course, inspiration, the, the, the rainbow challenge. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. I think it originated in Italy, where children are creating rainbows to create some cheer while they're stuck at home. Um, so just thinking about these sort of things that you can do while people are in isolation to remind them that they support you, but also that you support them and to provide that kind of engaging, playful action. I think now more than ever, that's, that's very much needed. The next example is around creating empathy. Creating empathy as an objective is so critical, whether you're ultimately hoping that people will give you money or you're hoping that they will take a campaign action with you or even just stick around for longer. Having a sense of empathy with the issue and the, the people or things affected by your issue can really, really build a strong bond. So again, going back to freedom from torture, 
this is an action that we've, I think they've had this life for many years now, but we designed it with them a few years ago, where they work, so they work with survivors of torture who arrive in the UK. And when they arrive in the UK, they sometimes don't speak the language, they've left their family behind. As you can imagine, they're quite traumatised. And especially in the post-Brexit age that we're in, they were experiencing a lot of a very unwelcoming behaviour. And so we wanted these survivors to feel supported, welcomed. And so we asked people to simply write a message of welcome to a survivor of torture. And we had just so many, so many messages written. It was absolutely fantastic. Those messages were simply printed off, put in a folder and made available for therapists to give the survivors if and when they thought that was valuable for them. We then uh, attempted to close the feedback loop by sending a thank you email from a survivor saying messages like yours mean so much to someone like me who's just arrived in the country. I say we tried to close the feedback loop because actually it didn't end there. People were then responding to the thank you with this and it just kept going because people really connected with this. And if you think about how light the technology is here, this is simply a form. There's nothing fancy. There's nothing expensive here. It's a form. But it enabled to create a really great sense of empathy. And the people who took this action were much more likely to then become a donor. So it, it really helped build the relationship. Another example of free and for torture and their new branding is that they ran a quiz to see if you could survive on the asylum allowance, which is something very small, at least like £37 a week. And you had to answer questions like difficult decisions you'd have to make, like do you buy a coat or do you buy food? And then you would get all these, this information from real survivors on how they'd gone through that. And again, relatively low technology using existing content that the organization had with a, a little bit of extra research, I think, involved there as well. The, the empathy message exchange we've also done for Care International, where we got people to write messages of support to the garment workers in Bangladesh who were experiencing sexual harassment and were, were standing up against it, like messages of solidarity. These were translated, taken to the, the factory in remote Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi village. Then responses were collected, retranslated and sent back to supporters. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be that complex. Message exchanges can work on a much more accessible, easy, easy level than this. But just to show the value that we were able to create by getting people to really see and communicate with the women who are standing up for their own rights and to provide them with support. I think that was just such a lovely network. And again, people who take part in this much more likely to take more actions, much more likely to become donors. And going way back in time now, this is another Care International. This was back when the refugee crisis was really kicking off. We, we created an experience where people had to make decisions, um, such as where they run to, what they prioritise, what they do next. So here, for example, the first question, they get this narrative about they have to flee their home in a split second. What do you take with you? And they choose what they take. What we then did a few days later is we said, hey, you decided you would take you know, your grandma's picture or, or whatever. Um, and we would share then real stories of real refugees who have had to make that decision and what they took. So, for example, this, this young lady here, she took this glove that her mother had made for her brother, who is now sadly deceased. And so we were able to connect decisions that supporters were making to decisions that real refugees have had to make. Another objective that an engagement action might help you achieve is gathering information. So any of you living in the UK are probably familiar with these guys. So the Great British Bee Count and Big Garden Watch, where people keep an eye out for the, you know, the wildlife in their garden and they report back. And that data is then valuable for the organization. Another recent example of this is Citizens UK are trying to work out how the coronavirus is affecting workers so it can better support them. And of course, for the objective to learn about your supporters, let's not forget the humble survey. So now more than ever, I think people have time and they're probably more likely to be at home on a computer. So if you have a survey that you want to do, something that's genuinely valuable for you, now is probably a good time to do it. As with all things, don't do it just because you feel like you should do something. Um, but if you feel like you would get value from asking your supporters questions right now, I think do consider that because a survey can really add value for you. So just to say, we're going to remember. Start with your objectives and your audience motivators. Spend some time on creativity. And remember that simple is OK. You don't have to be spending lots of money or lots of time in order to, to get the results that you want. Some of, these, some of these executions we've seen do require development. Some of them are just a form. Some of them are just a nice piece of content. So don't be discouraged. But if you take the time on creativity that you need to, 
you'll find that it, it really pays off in getting something valuable out there, either using existing content you have or stuff that you can easily get hold of. So I wanted to just take a quick second here to ask you what examples you've seen of, of good engagement activity, both before the shutdown and after the shutdown. So I'll hand back to Jess for a few minutes now to run this a little bit. Okay, just unmuting myself. Okay, so once again, we'll be opening up a couple of um, Google Docs for you to jump into and add some links. Again, I hope this will be a really useful exercise for everybody to see some examples that are occurring to you as you're going through um, the kinds of objectives and the kinds of examples that Claire's shown um, to help us all get a bit more inspiration. So what I'm gonna do is post in the chat pane um, two links and hopefully they'll work as links this time. Um, one for a document where you can share examples of engagement actions you can think of. These could be your own organisations or other, others you've seen. So engagement actions from pre-crisis, not related to the, the current situation. And then a second link for examples you can think of which are more current. So any interesting engagement actions you can see going on. You know, the, the rainbows that Claire mentioned would be would be an obvious one. If you've got links you can share, that's great, but otherwise just a bit of narrative. And hopefully we can just quickly crowdsource a really interesting and inspiring list of, of the kind of engagement actions that, that uh, organisations are trying. So we'll just take, um, I've just posted those links, uh, sent to all, those should be appearing in the chat now. Um, and we'll take just three or four minutes for you to pop in your examples before we move on. We'll just take one more minute.
lots of great examples here. Somebody else has obviously been taking part in Joe Wick's PE lessons in the mornings. My legs are still sore. <laughs> cool. Okay, we'll leave it there. Though again, the documents will remain open, so you can continue to contribute to these. We'll keep them open for at least an hour after the session before we circulate to the group. So I'll hand back to Claire. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to, before we gather questions, to say, um, oh, actually on questions, if, so what we're gonna do, as we've said, this webinar system has a questions facility. We're not going to have time to get back to them now because there's just too many people. But please do post questions you have within the within the webinar facility here by clicking on the questions button. We will be collecting those and responding to them after the webinar. So I thank you for your patience on that. You can also, of course, reach out to us by email if you wanted to. I will leave the webinar running for a few minutes after we wrap up so you can post questions if you haven't done those yet. So as we've said, for next steps, we're going to be running workshops in a few weeks, which are going to be inspired by the challenges that you guys have shared towards the beginning here. So if you've signed up for this webinar, we will communicate with you about those workshops and we will do our best to allocate audiences in a sensible way for those. Um, but our apologies that we, we simply won't be able to accommodate all 250 people into workshops. But I hope that the steps here have been valuable for you anyway. And I just wanted to say we can help you. So more onion, our bread and butter is mobilization. Engagement actions are a really core part of what, what we do. So if you're looking for support with any of this, we're very happy to hear from you. We're very happy to, to talk to you about your challenges and how we can support you. So whether you're looking for help with how do we work remotely? How do we keep the ball rolling in these more challenging times? We can help you with that. We're actually based in five different locations and we specialize in digital. So remote working is really our bread and butter. So if you've got plans, you've backburnered, or you're not really sure how to proceed because this is all a little bit unusual for your organization, we can help you out. So please do, do reach out to us and we'll, we'll explore how we can support you with your particular needs. Whether you're trying to develop engagement actions, support journeys, generate new supporters for your email list, for example. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to help you in any way we can. As I say, I'm going to leave the, the webinar open for questions. If you have any, um, please do post them there. But otherwise, just to say thank you so much for your attention today. Really grateful and stay healthy and stay happy and best of luck with all of your, your support communication work.